Hello everyone, welcome back, or if you're new here then hi, hello. My name is Vera and I'm glad you're here. If I'm not mistaken, then yesterday, The Three Body Problem on Netflix just premiered. And since I've been on a little bit of a sci-fi kick this past month or so, I decided that the best way to continue this was to also read The Three Body Problem in preparation for this TV show. As of now, I know The Three Body Problem by reputation only. I am a little bit worried that the science will go over my head. I hope I'll understand something. And if I don't, please feel free to explain stuff in the comments. And I'll check back in when I finish book one. First off, I don't feel smart enough for this. I remember like I started the book and I was like, whoa, what is going on? It is so intense. And then when it got into more of the sciencey stuff, I mean, look, when I say I study science, I mean medicine, not theoretical physics. And there's a huge gap between the two disciplines. Brain surgery. <laughs> not exactly rocket science. Isn't it? And even though some of it definitely went over my head, I can't lie, I still really enjoyed the way all these like scientific aspects were explored throughout the book. I think uh, the author, Tsishin Liu, really helped a non-scientific audience understand these very complex theories. I adored the start of the book. It starts off with a revolution, and I think in the second or third chapter, this book, Silent Spring, is mentioned uh, by Rachel Carson, which was very important in the environmentalist movement, and I actually read it a few years back, and so this reference to the impact of Silent Spring on our main characters really worked for me because it helped me kind of situate myself within the story. Unfortunately, that is where my personal and emotional connection kind of stopped, and that's why I can't give this book more than a six and a half, which I still think that six and a half stars is quite good for a first book in the series. I feel like this book doesn't really have an emotional center, and I know that this is probably not what the author was going for, but for me to really latch onto a book and love it, I do need that personal connection either to the character or the way the theme is explored, and that's just not what happens here. The focus is very much on the science and on the plot, and that's fine. That's totally fine. It's just not my personal preference. That's my and the thing is, when I was reading this book, I felt like there were two very obvious emotional centers that could have been utilized, but they just weren't. The first one is Yawen Jia. The first chapter starts off with her father dying. I think that if we focus more on her emotional aspects of how his death affected her, I think that could have helped, especially since there are some other revelations to do with her and her past that come in later on in the book. And the other emotional center that I'd like to propose is Wang Miao, the other POV character. There's one chapter, I think, where his son and his wife make an appearance. And I think that if they were brought up a bit more after that, one chapter and Wang Miao's inner turmoil, if it was focused as well on what these discoveries that occur could mean for his family, I think that that could have really, really helped in my emotional tie to the book. I will now go into spoilers, so when you see this symbol disappear, that's going to be a sign for you that spoilers are done. So when it came to the three body game, that was my thing. I absolutely adored every single sequence of Wang Miao going into uh, the three body game. I think the scene that stood out to me the most was the computer scene. Oh my gosh, it was insane. And I feel the way it was explained so well with the demonstration in the beginning with the uh, with the flags, you know, like nor gate, the and gate, the or gate. I took a few classes in uh, programming a couple years back, so I kind of knew a little bit, but the way it was explained was so approachable and I was honestly in awe and it created such an interesting visual for me as well. So I, I think that that scene was um, an absolute highlight in the book. I'm done with the spoilers now. Anyways, I heard that book two is fantastic and I was also watching Matt's book reviews and that I think he gave like three and a half out of five for the next, for the first book and then five out of five for uh, book two. So I'm really excited. Oh, and this actually jogs my memory. I was flabbergasted when Matt commented on my first video and then on my Dune video that was like, Pfft. and now as of like two days ago, Jay from Captured in Words is also subscribed to this channel. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually don't even know what to say. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll see you when I finish The Dark Forest.
I'm taking back everything I said about book one being scientifically complex and thought-provoking because next to this, that was child's play. <laughs> I think the easiest way for me to talk about this book is to break it down into three different segments because my final rating is an average of what I thought of those three. In the beginning, I must admit that I was confused, mostly because we changed our entire set of characters. Ye Wen Jia only appears in the first chapter and Wang Miao is only mentioned like in the very, very end and not even by name. So yeah, it did take me a little bit of time to adjust to the new characters, but after I did, I actually started to enjoy the book. <laughs> more importantly, understand what was going on. Yeah! And the purpose of this very long and extended segment became very clear. In part one, I think Sishin Liu wanted to focus on developing his characters. I think he did this because love becomes a quite important theme towards latter parts of the book. So for a good third of this book, we just spent the time with a certain character. I do still think that to some extent, the detached writing style of the author wasn't conducive to me getting very attached to this character, but overall I'd still say that I was more invested in him than I was in the characters of book one. And so overall my rating for this segment would be a 6 out of 10 because it was quite meandering, it was very very confusing for me to reorient myself in the beginning, but once it got going I could kind of see what the author was going for and I enjoyed it. Then we have the middle segment and I'd say this was the longest one, but I did quite enjoy it. It sharply pivots into a more scientifically intriguing and plot-heavy story. But because it's so plot-heavy, it's hard for me to talk about without going into spoilers. So once again, when you see this symbol disappear, then that's your sign that spoilers are over. So this middle part is the wall facer wall breaker part. And I thought it was crazy. <laughs> when the first wall facer, Tyler, committed suicide, I was in shock. Then I was even more taken aback by Wolfazer Diaz's plan to destroy like the entire solar system by throwing mercury into the sun. And then the scene where he gets, uh, when he flies home and he gets stoned by people from his nation. It was such an interesting visual, such an interesting visual, almost biblical. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I'm pretty sure one of the apostle apostles also gets stoned. And so it was a very, very provocative scene. But then when we got to Wallfacer Hines and his wife Kiko and her being the wall breaker for him, <laughs> that was that was the craziest plot twist ever. I could not even comprehend what I was reading. I think I found his plan with the neural networks and mind control to be the most interesting. And I think that's because of my personal background. When I started reading that segment, I couldn't stop thinking about these things called inhibitory neurons that we have. And essentially the way they work is, okay, technically if you very tried, you could cut off your finger or you could like place your hand on a burning stove, right? But your brain prevents you from doing that. So where you have some neurons that like allow you to do an action, then you have some neurons that also prevent you from doing that action. And the way that Heinz's plan kind of worked on the more cerebral part of this mechanism and made it more quantum and um, I don't know, I, I thought it was very interesting because I kind of visualized that entire plan as kind of I don't know, an application to the inhibitory neurons, but like not really. Anyways, I thought it was very interesting and it was actually something I understood. The reason why I can't really give it more than an 8 out of 10 is because I think Luo's story kind of fell off here. I feel like the author kind of missed out on an opportunity to further develop the reader's appreciation for Luo Ji and to his like personal struggles, especially with the final idea at the end of the novel that humanity reaches out uh, to the other civilizations in the cosmos because we have love and therefore perhaps the dark forest theory that is presented could be curbed in a way if two societies that value love work together. I think it's such a shame because, spoiler for the next part of this video, but I thought that the, f I thought that the ending of this book was fantastic, especially with the final interaction being between the Trisolarian that initially um, contacted Yo and Jia and uh, tried to make her stop and and was a pacifist you know because it that that curbs the dark forest theory because here you do have a true pacifist and the other one has is a true pacifist and 
I don't know. I, I thought that the ending was very beautiful and I just wish that this middle segment with Luo Ji be expanded a bit upon. Oh, and also the Jiang Beihai storyline kind of left me confused. Like the entire uh, battle of the ships at the very end. I'm not quite sure what happened there. So if someone can explain that, <laughs> do. And that's why I think that the middle segment of the Dark Forest really is a very strong 8 out of 10. But then we have the ending. And that this ending was one of the best endings I have ever read. But it fumbles the emotional aspect. So that's why the ending for me was like a nine and a half out of 10. This is definitely one of the most thought provoking endings that I've ever read. And I really appreciated the main character uh, giving us an info dump and explaining the entire theory because I would have been lost without it. And you know what? I really think that in this case, an info dump added to my experience. I think it would have been really easy for the author to do a deus ex machina, but he did. And this truly elevated him in my eyes because when we got to the point of all is lost, I, I genuinely thought <laughs> there's, no, there's no way we're getting out of here, especially since the author up until this point tries to make things as grounded as possible. And I didn't really see a way out of it without a deus ex machina. I found out as well that the theory that he presents at the very end, the scientific community was like, hmm, actually, this is quite smart. Yeah, we're going to make this into an actual possible theory, an actual theory that could possibly solve Fermi paradox. I mean, <laughs> do I have to say more? My rating for the overall book averages out to an 8 out of 10. To be honest, at this point, I have no clue where the series could go because I feel like book two really ties everything up very nicely. But <laughs> I was looking on Goodreads and the title of the series name is Remembrance of Earth's Past. That doesn't make me very optimistic for what's going to happen in book three. But I'm very excited and yeah, wow, I, pff, I'm still not over that ending. Read this book, guys. I'll check back in when I'm finished with the book. Wow, this was a very expensive book. <laughs> in fact, it was so expensive, I don't even know where to start when it comes to my opinions on it. And it kind of had me wondering if it wouldn't have been better as two books. I'll cut straight to the chase and say straight off that I gave this a 5.5 .5 out of 10. And I hope I'll be kind of able to convey why I think that as we move on. So the structure of this book is very interesting because it starts off in the past, like way in the past in um, Constantinople. And then it kind of gives us a second perspective of the events of book one, then book two, and then it starts functioning as a sequel. Yeah, it's rewind time. The stuff before the sequel storyline was quite interesting and I wasn't lost like I was in book two because of the character change. Uh, because I kind of knew that I should be expecting it. I also found the character Yun uh, Tiangmeng, who is very much the main character for this backstory segment. I, I found him very interesting and I loved the more artistic way that he would narrate his segments. But this isn't the bulk of the story that I'd like to discuss because I think that the sequel part is much more relevant to my rating. Here kind of is where my first problem arises. Um, Luoji, the main character of book two, does appear in book three, um, but I kind of feel like his entire character is revamped for the purposes of kickstarting the plot again. And I really don't like that when it happens to a character. There is an emotional character involving him and the Mona Lisa later on in the book, but other than that, it, it truly felt like his character just regressed and a lot of his personal journey in book two was undermined, so I really wasn't a fan of how he was handled. But I did kind of come to the conclusion, I think that when I reread book two, I'll definitely give it an even higher score than an eight because the confusion element will be gone and I find myself more and more growing attached to Luo Ji the more I think about him. But okay, let's not focus on the characters because the author doesn't really focus on them and let's focus on what actually happens in the sequel part and the focus is once again the plot and the science and i'd say that this plot is the most science driven 
of the three books. What did he say? I will divide the sequel plotline into kind of two segments because I think that's the easiest way I can talk about it. So the first segment kind of talks about sociology on the cosmic level and I thought it was great. The author creates these two characters, Chen Xing and Thomas Wade, and they kind of act as mirror characters of each other where one is very much the compassionate side of humanity and the other is more the logical, emotionless rationalism. And I thought that the contrast between these two is a very interesting way to kind of explain these uh, bigger philosophies about these, this cosmic sociology. There are also some events that happen in Australia, which I thought were very thought provoking, but I won't get into them because of spoilers. Arnar. And selfishly, I do kind of wish we got more of that segment. And it also felt like a very natural and terrifying progression of the ideas explored in book two. But then we encounter my problems. Arnar. As we got closer to part two of the sequel plotline, I kind of started feeling, what more is there to tell? Like, I have so many more pages left and I, I truly don't know where the story could go. And Sishin Lu's answer to where the plot is going to go became physics, very theoretical physics. And again, I'm not a theoretical physicist and I feel like my enjoyment here was greatly impacted by my lack of knowledge of these theorems that he explored in very complex ways. You know when you read fantasy your brain just kind of turns off and is like okay yeah I don't need to like have all of this explained because it's fantasy like I'll just take the humongous crab people from uh the way of kings and I don't need like an explanation of their biology because it's it's crab people. In the previous books in this series everything felt like it could be a natural progression of the physics that we have today and that's why because of my lack of physical knowledge I, I feel like my enjoyment was impacted because the things that occur in this book stop being realistic for my brain, for my brain's understanding of the the way that the world works, you know? So instead of being thought-provoking and realistic, because I just don't know enough about the subject, it just felt cheap and it just felt like the stakes were so low because I, it's like I felt the author's hand pushing the plot, even though, again, I assume that that's not what's happening. I, I hope I'm making sense. I don't know, the ending just really left me with a sour taste in my mouth, I have to say. I'll put the spoiler tag again because I, I want to get into a little bit of spoilers here. So what I was talking about with the theoretical physics kind of aspect is um, like the 2D space collapsing the solar system. What was that? I saw on Reddit someone explaining it as like a droplet falling onto a piece of paper and it kind of spreading out. So in a sense, you could say that that's a real world visualization of what would happen if a 3D object, a droplet, um, expanded into this two dimensional plane. And like, okay, but it was too much for me, you know? It also seemed just so fantastical that like a magical membrane appears and suddenly it swallows everything. Oh, but it's actually not creating a 2D object because those don't exist, because they don't have depth. It's actually just like the image that they see as the planets are collapsing from Pluto is actually just like the energy traces, whatever. Like, like I don't, my brain just doesn't it doesn't compute that the other thing why i think the ending just felt really cheap for me is because it ends with the universe collapsing not earth not the solar system the universe we're starting from ground zero maybe there's like you could say that oh there's a poetic aspect to this because oh it was the earth that was supposed to collapse but then in reality everything collapses and i don't know i for me it just felt cheap there's a reason why stories about a universal collapse are rarely ever written and the answer is because they're very hard to pull off. If your stakes at the end become the collapse of the entire like reality, how am I supposed to care about the stakes earlier on in the series? You know, everything before this universal collapse just feels devoid of meaning. Maybe I'm just too stupid for this. If I was going to recommend you the series, I would say 100% please read books one and two, back to back, no question about it. I think that the ending of book two is so beautiful, so concise, so thought-provoking. Yeah, I, I, I think everyone should read books one and two, to be honest. Book three, where I did enjoy some aspects of it, the ending just really bogged it down for me. 
And so I'd say if you really enjoy physics, do read book three. But if you don't, I won't blame you if you stop at book two. Now, as for the TV show, I'm actually recording this Friday morning, so I really hope that I get this out in time. So far, I watched the first six-ish episodes, and I have to say, episodes one and two were fantastic. I absolutely loved them. I thought that the slower pacing that kind of makes you situate yourself more in the, the interpersonal relationships between the Oxford Five and uh, Yo and Gia's uh, backstory, I loved that. I loved that. Then episodes three and four kind of turn the accelerator on to 100% and we go into overdrive. I didn't think traveling at light speed was possible at this part in the series, but uh, <laughs> D&D definitely uh, <laughs> used it when writing the script. I think episodes five and six kind of have slowed down a little bit, but they're still way beyond where I feel like they should be. The biggest strength right now is creating the interpersonal relationships that are lacking in the books. I really like how D&D are taking these smaller irrelevant characters and kind of joining them with other more central characters of a plot. And the other thing that they're doing really, really well is the foreshadowing. The foreshadowing is so good, but I really wish that they held off the reveals for a bit further down the line. I mean, delaying gratification is what makes these series so interesting and, you know, you can theorize about them and everything. And I just feel like maybe it's because everything dropped all at once and I wouldn't have this emotion if they spaced it out and had the episodes drop weekly, but there's a huge reveal in I think episode four and I really feel like that could have worked better as an end of the series reveal. But yeah, other than that, I'm cautiously optimistic. I do kind of wish that they'd w go into the science of it all a little bit more, but I do also really appreciate the characters and especially Thomas Wade. I, oh my god, he's my standout for now. Please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Anyways, that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon. Bye bye